Lovely. Thank you everybody for joining us for this AMAG seminar today. Thank you for making the time to be with us. Um, we also thank Dr. Doran Sher for making time for us. Um, he is our, one of our wonderful orthopedic surgeons and one of Sydney's top orthopods. He is an elbow, shoulder and knee specialist um, with expertise also in um, sports related injury. Um, he is renowned for his comp for his complex and holistic approach to treatment and care of patients and also for his excellent medico legal reports so we are very very proud to have him on our panel now uh, as you are all on i have been muting your microphones and i ask that you please remain muted during the presentation the reason for this is so that no feedback from your home or workplace interferes with the recording um, also <coughs> beg pardon to any of you who choose to share your camera with us, may I ask that if you have uh, family members or people at home and they come in to speak to you, please don't let them take their clothes off, which did happen to us in one of our seminars, meaning that we couldn't share the recording with anybody. Um, at the end of the session, there will be time for you to ask questions of Dr. Cher. So if you could either um, wait till then, or if you have to leave, pop your question in the chat and we will have it attended to at the end of the session. And uh, you will get the recording of the session within a day or so sent to you. Of course, all our recordings are available on our YouTube channel at any time. So you can watch them again with your team um, for, for more learning and education. Um, handing over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Cher. Um, uh, Michelle, thank you very much and uh, thanks everyone for joining us here today and, and while you are on mute, I actually am happy to take questions uh, during the session, uh, you know, 45 minutes to an hour is a long time to just sit there and not interact and in fact there's one section that I am going to ask you a question so fair warning now uh, that I will ask uh, for one or two um, replies uh, at some stage. Just by, by way of introduction, you know my name's Doron Scher. I'm a knee, elbow and shoulder surgeon. I've been in, in practice in Australia for 20 years and as well as the medical legal stuff, I've more recently started uh, working as a medical assessor for the PIC, which has been uh, very interesting as a learning experience. The majority of my practice deals with sporting and workplace injuries, but of course I also do a, a fair bit of arthroplasty. And I know that, um, MAG has already had uh, lectures on shoulder and knee in the past, and I, I've given one previously on, on range of motion assessment, but I actually wanted to ask some of you some questions during this lecture um, to do with, uh, you know, when somebody has had an injury and it's an existing injury and then they get injured again at work, uh, whose responsibility it is to deal with that. Um, Right, so uh, this seems like a, a silly question, but if we're gonna discuss joint instability, the first question really to ask is what is a joint? And, and in a basic sense, it's a structure in the body where two parts of the skeleton fit together. Joints allow bones to move against one another or to articulate to allow us to move the skeleton. In most cases, there's a shiny white cartilage covering the end of the bone encased in a balloon-like structure called the capsule. The shiny white stuff is called articular cartilage and it doesn't have a blood supply. This is important because damage to the articular cartilage doesn't heal. So the question is, how does it survive for all these years without a blood supply? That's because the lining of the joint inside the capsule called the synovium produces synovial fluid, which has nutrients. And that's where the articular cartilage gets its um, health from. The definition of arthritis is damage to the joint lining. So regardless of how insignificant or major it is, once you've got damaged joint lining or articular cartilage, you then have arthritis. I mean, there are other types of arthritis, such as psoriatic arthritis or rheumatoid arthritis, but in this sense, traumatic osteoarthritis is what we're talking about. And as the arthritis progresses, patients generally develop pain and stiffness in the joints. And one of the common consequences of the joint dislocation is damage to the joint lining cartilage. <clears throat> so before we can discuss the topic, which is instability, we need to understand that joints are designed to move. If there wasn't some slack in the system, there couldn't be any movement at all. 
And different people have different amounts that their joints can move. So for example, my wife is a Pilates instructor and yoga person who has really stretchy joints. She can bend over and touch her toes really easily. Whereas I'm one of those really stiff people that struggle to touch their toes, but I can lift heavy weights quite comfortably. So we're genetically different. And with each of these, there's a different set of advantages and disadvantages. So the, the, the degree of joint looseness is medically described by the term laxity. In many cases, the amount of movement can be quantified. So if I can describe, if I'm going to push a shoulder a quarter of way, halfway, or completely out of the joint when I'm examining it. So we're going to cover several of the most commonly dislocated joints today, but by far the most commonly dislocated joint in all settings is the shoulder. And certainly from a work cover uh, perspective, this is going to be the most um, injured joint. So with respect to shoulders, laxity refers to asymptomatic translation of the humeral head and the glenoid. So that means it doesn't bother the person. The shoulder can move more than what it might otherwise, but it doesn't bother them. Instability refers to symptoms. So if they have symptomatic excess of translation of the humeral head on the glenoid. And it's really important to understand the difference between laxity and instability. So one way of defining a dislocation is listed here, an injury in which the bones in a joint are forced apart and out of their usual positions. In most cases, it requires a lot of force and creates significant pain and disability. Typically, the tissues around the joint are damaged, and this can lead to further episodes of instability in some cases. There are, however, some people who dis um, an instability episode doesn't necessarily damage them. So when a joint doesn't completely go out of joint, but is instead only partly out of place, this is called a subluxation. And so when you're seeing these definitions, you know, uh, laxity, instability, and subluxation, hopefully now you have a, 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 an appreciation of what the medical people are referring to when they're dealing with these um, incidents. So a subluxation is more likely to happen in someone with ligamentous laxity. And in some people, they don't actually damage the surrounding tissues, but a subluxation in someone tight like me can cause as much damage as a full dislocation might otherwise. So looking at these two images, you can see that the shape of the ball of the hip, that's the one on the left hand side, is virtually completely covered by the socket. And therefore it's very rare to dislocate your hip. Whereas if you look at the image on the right, you can see that the flat glenoid is virtually no cover at all for the humeral head. And so the shoulder is much more likely to dislocate. Despite these obvious differences, they're both called ball and socket joints. So I think, you know, this slide would be intuitive for most people. The more stretchy you are and the more trauma your body suffers, the more likely it is that your joint will dislocate. So you may have heard the term multi-directional instability. This means that the joint can go out in more than one direction. So this generally refers to the shoulder more so than any other joints. And it's less likely to result from a, from a significant traumatic episode and can be caused by genetic or soft tissue problems or chronic stretching without a single traumatic episode. So when somebody comes into my office and I'm, I'm finding out you know, what's happened with their dislocation, the history is generally very straightforward and it's rarely confused with anything other than perhaps a broken bone. Most patients actually have to go to the emergency department to have the joint put, put back in place. And knowing whether this happened, has happened before alters the treatment recommendations in many instances. So for example, if this is the 10th dislocation, uh, that patient may not need any investigations at that particular episode, but if it's a first time dislocation, absolutely they're gonna need uh, X-ray and perhaps even advanced imaging that's required. Now, collagen disorders is important because this is, if they've got a collagen disorder, we may not uh, want to operate on them. And um, again, have they had previous trauma which created the big injury initially and now was this something very minor that caused it to happen um, secondarily. So now we're gonna start talking a little bit about specific joints. The shoulder is the most dislocated joint in the body. We're gonna go into the anatomy in a little bit of detail so you understand why that's the case. But I'd like you to notice on the left-hand side there, those yellow structures 
um, named labeled LCPC and MC, which are the nerves that run from the neck through the brachial plexus and down to the arm. And if the shoulder goes out anteriorly, those structures can get stretched and damaged and you can get a brachial plexus injury. So if you don't look for the brachial plexus injury and particularly the axillary nerve injury, you might not realize that it's been damaged. And shoulder dislocations are gonna to happen to somewhere between two and 8% of the population. So looking at the glenohumeral anatomy, um, you, you can see on this image over here, the biceps tendon going down around the corner. You can see the humeral head, the glenoid, and there are these bands of tissue running from one side to the other, and then a thicker band of tissue down the bottom. If we open the shoulder and look inside, you'll see them labeled the SGHL, superior glenohumeral ligament, middle glenohumeral ligament, and inferior glenohumeral ligament. And what these are, these are thickenings of the capsule. And what they do is they stop the shoulder going out of joint. And as you move your shoulder, you'll see that this hammock down the bottom moves from either being at the bottom, at the front or at the back. And as you rotate your arm backwards and forwards, it stops the shoulder going out of joint. If it wasn't for the ligaments and the muscles, the ball would simply fall off the socket. And the capsule, as we mentioned, is a bit like a balloon which surrounds the whole joint and keeps the fluid inside it. All right, now you're allowed to unmute yourself because there's actually a prize for this answer. Does anybody know why your shoulders don't dislocate when you're asleep or when you die? So I'll give, you know, maybe 10 seconds for somebody to come up with an answer and then win the prize. If I don't get any answers in, the, in five or six seconds, I'll just tell you the answer. But the prize is worthwhile. All right, no takers. That's if fine. You, if you don't know how to unmute yourself, people, um, it's at the very bottom of your screen, the icon that looks like a microphone with a line struck through it. If exactly. you click on it, it will unmute. So no takers? Hmm. That's fine. The reason is there's, there's a vacuum inside your shoulder. The body actually creates negative intra-articular pressure inside the capsule, which holds the joint in place. So if someone dies, if you have a cadaver, the shoulder doesn't dislocate. But if you actually open the capsule and let air into it, the shoulder will then dislocate. And interestingly, the vacuum actually reestablishes itself within about 24 hours after shoulder surgery. Um, so the, the body is quite incredible that it uses that vacuum as well as the capsule, as well as the external muscles to actually keep the shoulder in joint. All right, what about the rotator cuff? So outside the capsule and the ligaments, there's the, the muscles which are referred to as the rotator cuff. Again, the names supraspinatus, infraspinatus, um, subscapularis and the teres minor, but you don't need to remember those. But what you do need to know is when those muscles squeeze, they squeeze the humeral head against the glenoid and that helps keep the shoulder in joint. If you tear any one of these, you're more likely to have anterior instability um, of your shoulder. So the left-hand image um, shows the glenoid over here. Um, and this is the, the articular cartilage that we discussed, that shiny white stuff, there's the bone. And this is the labrum or the bumper, which should be sitting right at the edge of the bone. When the ball rolls forward, it hits the bumper and it stays in joint. And this is that capsule that we mentioned beforehand. This is an arthroscopic view showing the bone of the glenoid. And this capsule is torn away. It should be attached over here. Um, so an, an isolated injury of the labrum without stretching the capsule is relatively rare. But if you did tear the labrum without stretching the capsule, theoretically, you could get laxity without instability. And this was studied uh, back in the 1990s by several authors such as uh, Biglianli and Speer. Um, but for the most part, that doesn't happen. So, Again, if you've been writing or reading reports, you may have come across the term ELPSA lesion. So anterior labial periosteal sleeve avulsion. And that's just a description of a particular type of injury to the labrum and capsule where the capsule and labrum have torn off from up here. Sorry, I'll go back to screen. Have, have torn off from over here and um, have healed onto the front part of the glenoid. Now, what that does is actually shorten the capsule and a lot of these people will lose 
external rotation on clinical examination. Now, that's somewhat counterintuitive. You might think that the patient would have a looser shoulder, but because it's healed in a, in a position further away, the shoulder is um, tighter than what it might otherwise have been. But if they go into abduction external rotation, they will still dislocate the shoulder because they're missing their bumper. Now, a slap lesion is the other thing you may have uh, heard of, and that's superior labrum anterior, posterior, anterior to posterior. And that refers to the labrum tearing at the top of the shoulder rather than the front or the back. And that's really only relevant in people under the age of about 30 and typically when they're doing ball throwing sports as well. All right, what about a heel sax lesion? Again, this is a term you will have heard. And what that is, is crushing of part of the joint lining of the back of the humeral head. So the humeral head is softer than what the glenoid is. This is cancellous bone, this is more cortical bone. When the humeral head goes out, the soft bone crushes against the hard bone. And then when you go back into joint, you see the defect at the back of this humeral head. And you can see quite clearly on this image here where the uh, defect is. Now, if that's a small defect, that's not too much of a problem. It's a bit like a tire in a car going over a small pothole. You don't really feel it. But if, if you have a very big pothole where the tire goes into the pothole and out the other side, you go clunk, clunk. And the same thing can happen with that hill sax lesion. It can get big enough that you eventually lose rotation and the shoulder can go out of joint each time. Now, a, a heel sacs lesion will be found in 80% of dislocations and 20% of subluxations. And so that tells you that the subluxations themselves are not benign. They are allowing enough movement for that humeral head to crush. The bigger the area of bone damage, the more likely the shoulder is to dislocate again. And when you combine the bone damage on the glenoid and the bone damage on the humeral head, you can actually do a, a calculation to work out, is the shoulder likely to dislocate and do I need to do a bone transfer operation to stop that happening? And once, once you get a large heel sacs lesion and a glenoid bone defect, the shoulder tends to start going out even in sleep. If the lesion comprises more than a third of the humeral articular cartilage, because that's what gets damaged, the joint lining of the humerus, then a soft tissue repair generally isn't enough to fix this. Um, what about capsular injury? Another term you may have heard is a haggle, um, humeral evulsion of the glenohumeral ligament. And that basically needs to be treated with open surgery. Keyhole surgery won't be able to repair that. All right, what about a glenoid fracture? So you know that bones and soft tissues need to be intact for the shoulder to stay stable. But when you fracture the glenoid or you break a piece of bone off the glenoid, you effectively reduce the amount of bone available for the humeral head to sit against. And so if a patient has a, a glenoid fracture, early surgery stops reabsorption of that bone and reduces the likelihood of them needing uh, further stabilization surgery or needing an open bone transfer operation. And that's why generally speaking, in people that have a glenoid fracture, we tend to operate on them early. Now, some people genetically have um, a flat glenoid and some people have what's called a retroverted or tilted glenoid, which essentially means that the humeral head is trying to fall out the back of the shoulder all the time. This is more of a genetic issue and it's almost impossible to fix surgically with very high rates of people going on to problems in their shoulder. This then becomes difficult because if somebody injures their shoulder at work and they've got this retroverted glenoid, we know that the long-term history is for them to do badly, but they also now have a you know, compensatable injury that we need to discuss. Most of these people are gonna end up with arthritis in their 40s and 50s. It's not something that happens much later in their life. So looking specifically at anterior inferior shoulder dislocations, anterior at the front, inferior down the bottom, which are the most common type. It's usually traumatic, and typically the arm is above the, uh, above the head into an abduction external rotation position. They can get a dead arm, which is stretching of those nerves of the brachial plexus that I pointed out earlier. And if it's traumatic, there's a very, very high recurrence rate. So various studies have shown different recurrence rates in a general population. 
But in people that play sport or work overhead, the evidence is very clear that the recurrence rate will be very high. There have been multiple studies showing that patients are unhappy with their shoulder even many years after their injury. So this particular study back in 1991 looked at um, an average of seven years after their initial dislocation, patients that were treated without surgery. And you can see that nearly half of them had pain with activity, more than half had um, a, a sensation of weakness and instability in their shoulder, and uh, nearly a third felt that the shoulder was unstable in their sleep. So really that's not acceptable from a medical treatment perspective. What about the, the risk of recurrence? Well, back in the 1940s, sort of 50s and 60s, we really didn't have decent operations to deal with shoulder instabilities. So there were lots of longitudinal studies looking at how likely you were to re-dislocate your shoulder without surgery. These studies typically didn't take into account factors such as playing contact sports or working in overhead professions. So we've got to realize that these numbers are probably an underrepresentation of uh, true redislocation rates without treatment. So if you look at row, 83% of people under the age of 20 redislocated. Once you got over the age of 40, it was a bit better. Cofield had slightly lower numbers, two thirds of patients under the age of 20 and none of his over the age of 40, but that was quite a sedentary population group. A more recent study, 2002, showed essentially that if you're uh, between you know, 20 and 30 years of age, that's your most uh, likely risk factor of coming out of joint. Now, Hevelius kind of was the landmark study looking at long-term outcomes and at what happened to the shoulder over time. So he only had a 50% recurrence, which I would say to you is uh, probably more than what's acceptable. And 22% with two or more recurrence stabilized spontaneously by 10 years. There is a big bust about that. He then looked at the associated injuries. And he found that there were often other injuries besides just the dislocation. And most of these injuries, in fact, if you substratified them, led to a higher dislocation rate. So if you've got a hill sex lesion, if you've got a bony bank heart lesion, you are more likely to re-dislocate. Interestingly, if you break the shoulder at the time of the dislocation in terms of your greater tuberosity, you've got a lower rate of redislocation, typically because you're stiff and you've lost movement in the shoulder. Probably the most relevant thing from um, Hevelius was that if you dislocated your shoulder more than twice, you were far more likely to develop arthritis in your shoulder when you were older. And this was also found by Marx in uh, 2002, where he, his patients were, were between 10 and 20 times greater uh, in terms of their risk of arthritis compared to the normal population. And so what this tells me is we want to stop people dislocating the, you know, two or more times. We want to get to them after their first dislocation to stop this uh, arthritis setting in in the future. Does surgery change this? Well, it does tell us quite convincingly that patients under 20 and probably under 40 should go straight to a shoulder stabilization operation if they want to prevent the onset of arthritis when they're older. So does immobilization without surgery work? Can you just put the person in a sling? Well, most patients that have their shoulder reduced in the emergency department are placed in a sling. This is very useful initially, but I often have patients turn up to my office several weeks later and they're still wearing the sling. This creates weakness and stiffness in the shoulder. So is there any use wearing a sling after having dislocated your shoulder? Other than for immediate pain relief, the answer is no. None of the studies that have um, shown sling versus no sling has shown any advantage in terms of redislocation. So once it's dislocated, once the pain's gone, they should consider having advanced imaging and surgery rather than going straight, rather than wearing a sling. So what about the first time dislocator? Well, they must have at least plain x-rays done on their shoulder to ensure that they haven't created a fracture which might need treatment. If there's any suspicion of bone loss, a CT scan is essential, and almost everyone's gonna end up with an MRI arthrogram to look at the labrum and capsule for surgical planning. Unfortunately, if you choose the wrong type of stabilization operation, and there are three, there's arthroscopic, open capsular shift, and a bone transfer, you can do the operation very well, but the patient still has a high recurrence rate and you have to know which operation is best for your particular patient.
So it's interesting that in New South Wales, ambulance officers are allowed to have two goes at reducing a shoulder before doing any imaging. Um, there are exclusions like being over 65, and they do need to tell the patient to go for an x-ray afterwards. Uh, but this is obviously such a common injury and, and close reduction of it is generally very successful. So they've now got an, a, a protocol um, to, that they can follow uh, without necessarily doing imaging first. Unfortunately, as you get older, it's more likely you're going to tear your rotator cuff rather than just the labrum with the shoulder dislocation. This is usually fairly obvious clinically, but unless you examine the patient's strength, it may be missed and then the tear may become irreparable, which may lead to the need for a reverse shoulder replacement to be performed. So in these, um, in, in the, you know, the 60 plus population group, it's very important that by six weeks, someone experienced has examined them and made sure that they haven't got ongoing weakness because they need an urgent MRI at that stage because we really would want to be operating within three months. What about the, the sort of patient that can uh, do a party trick where they can pop the shoulder in and out on demand? Well, that's a big red flag and surgery is almost never offered to these people. All right, so that's pretty much um, shoulders, which are the most common joint. Uh, I'm, I'm again, happy to take any questions if there are any at this point. What I might do is just slowly move on to the next part. And if you do have any questions, again, we can do them now or later either way. The AC joint is a slightly different type of joint to the glenohumeral joint. It's not a ball and socket. It's mainly a, a fibrous joint. And in fact, dislocating your AC joint is tearing your coracoclavicular ligament. So going from the coracoid to the clavicle is a very thick band of tissue, the conoid and tra trapezoid ligaments. And that's what connects your scapula to the rest of your body. Now there's six grades of AC joint injury. Grades one and two are basically sprains without any significant displacement. At grade three, you can get popping up of the clavicle and then you'll see a lump over the top of the shoulder. Grades four, five, and six are typically dislocations of some nature. And generally speaking, grades four, five, and six need surgery to be able to put them back. If it's a grade one, two, or three, you'll see the coracoclavicular ligament injury as a separation of, an, of the AC joint. But even with what seems to be quite a few, quite a severe injury, within a few months, most people will get back to all their usual activities without having had an operation. And while there may be a lump there, there is usually little disability. Um, if it does become a problem, uh, there is a chronic reconstruction option that can be done as well. And I certainly have had very good results doing that. So generally speaking, unless it's a four, five or six dislocation, AC joints, don't get surgery these days. All right, what about the elbow? The elbow is the second most dislocated joint after the shoulder. Um, and a lot of that's uh, dealt with uh, by having children having pulled elbows. Uh, but in, in adults, it's more likely from a fall on an outstretched arm. And so what happens is the elbow rotates out, pops back, and unfortunately, um, it, uh, it can get stuck out. Now, despite the elbow commonly being dislocated, unlike the shoulder, the elbow rarely leads to ongoing issues. A lot of people that fall directly onto the elbow or hand may not even realize that the joint has actually been dislocated. They know they've hurt it, but may not realize that it's dislocated until imaging is performed, showing one of the uh, signs of an elbow dislocation, such, such as a coronoid tip fracture. The sports like cycling, rollerblading, skateboarding, and gymnastics tend to be the most common sports related causes, but it can happen as well with a slip on a wet floor, somebody tripping on oil, just falling straight onto the outstretched arm. So we can think of them as simple dislocations, which are the ligaments only or complex where bone and ligament is involved. Most simple dislocations can be treated without, without surgery. And of course there are some exceptions to it, but once they've been reduced, mobilized for a period of time and then rehabilitated, further dislocations are really quite rare. If there's a bone and ligament injury, then urgent surgery is almost always required. You need to have the elbow reduced and then usually fix the bone problem and then um, fix the ligament. Okay, thank well. you. Cheers. Okay. All right, I'll keep going. Um, radial head fractures occur in about 10% of elbow dislocations. 
And in, in the past, we didn't really understand the anatomy and how to stabilize the elbow. So you may well have heard the term terrible triad injury. So there were three aspects to the injury. There was a radial head fracture, a coronoid tip fracture, and a lateral ligament injury. And the reason they were called terrible triads was because the, the surgical results were actually very poor because we didn't really understand how to fix them. The terrible triad nowadays is actually a fairly routine thing that we deal with and the labels become less relevant, but it is still potentially a very serious injury uh, for the elbow. So I guess in a nutshell, again, uh, it's a fairly high trauma injury. Most of the time it's obvious that it's dislocated, but elbows, unlike shoulders, generally will put back in and not have ongoing instability issues. And that's why the shoulder is so important because uh, despite having put the shoulder back in uh, in a fairly rapid fashion, we know that huge numbers of these pa patients are going to re-dislocate regardless of what, whether they're at work or at home or anywhere else. All right, moving on to the knee. The most common dislocation is not actually the main knee or tibiofemoral joint, but the patella kneecap or patella femoral joint. You can see in the image on the left-hand side over here, the, um, the round circle is showing you an image of the patella. Now you've got a comparison on the right side. This is the patella sitting on the femur or thigh bone, and this is where it's supposed to be sitting. This patella has jumped out of joint and is sitting laterally. Now, if you ever come across somebody with a dislocated patella, <clears throat> the knee will always be bent. And the simplest way to help that patient is to straighten out the knee and that'll jump the patella back into its groove. And that's something a lot of the ambulance officers do. There are many factors contributing to patella instability, most of which are genetic. So if someone happens to dislocate the patella at work, if there wasn't a direct trauma directly to the patella, probably at some stage in their life, this was going to happen together. It was going to happen anyway. So the patella sits in a V-shaped groove. And if one side of that V is flat, the patella doesn't have a high wall to jump over. They can also have some twisting of their femur called internal femoral torsion. And they can also have generalized laxity and the kneecap can be too, too high called patella alta. Now, if someone has normal anatomy, they don't have that patella alta, they ha don't have the uh, hypoplastic femoral condyle or the internal femoral torsion, then if they just have a traumatic injury to the patella, most of them will um, be able to continue without having had uh, any surgery to the knee and they'll be able to return to most of their function. People that have high demands on the knee, you know, sports uh, people, people that do things like uh, volleyball, basketball, jumping sports, about 50% aren't able to return to their previous level of function until they have surgery. And in these people, as well as the recurrent dislocators, there's now an operation called an MPFL reconstruction or the medial patellofemoral ligament reconstruction, which is a relatively minimally invasive operation with four relatively small scars around the knee, but it has a very, very high success rate at reducing and holding the patella in place without resorting to major operations like, a re like realignments or uh, patella uh, tib tibial tubicle transfers. So we see over here um, the uh, trochlear groove that the knee sits in, the patella is being moved up and out the way. And you can see that it's got to kind of jump up and over that wall to go out. Most patella dislocations are lateral, um, but it is possible to get a superior or medial dislocation with the patella dislocated from the groove. So that's somewhat different from a knee dislocation. A knee dislocation is when the tibiofemoral joint itself goes out, and that's a high energy traumatic injury. So that's gonna happen in a car crash, in a rugby tackle. It's not gonna be somebody just slipping over at work. Um, it can happen with things like skiing as well. It is relatively rare, and when it does happen, you have to have a very high suspicion that the person has injured either a nerve or an artery. And even with immediate surgery, these generally have a, a poor prognosis. So a knee dislocation is not something that you would really wish anybody to have. What about a hip dislocation? Well, we've already seen that the hip is very well covered by the acetabulum. Um, and so to get the hip to fracture is quite hard. Again, usually high energy injury, uh, motor vehicle accident, uh, something like that. 
it's a relative medical emergency when it occurs in adults because the blood supply to the hip is somewhat disrupted when it goes out of joint and you want to get it back into joint as quickly as you possibly can um, to be able to restore the blood supply. Also, it's often associated with an acetabular fracture and it can cause um, significant bleeding into the joint and the surrounding tissues. The amount of time taken to reduce the hip seems to influence the likelihood of the joint surviving. So what about dislocated fingers? Well, these are really, really injury. It's usually the middle knuckle of, of the four fingers that, that goes, and that's called the PIP joint, the proximal interphalangeal joint. And typically it happens when you bend the finger too far backwards or when you reach to grab something and you get a blow to the tip of your finger. Um, and that's when you end up with uh, quite a crooked finger, uh, as you see on the uh, image and, and that x-ray over there. Um, it, uh, sometimes the ambulance officers can put it back in, but generally a ring block is needed to make the finger go numb to be able to put it back in. And there are instances where tissue can get caught in the joint. And unfortunately, this tends to make joints very, very stiff. Without extensive physiotherapy, the finger may not move properly. And there are certain instances where the joints damage or the tendons damage that you may end up needing an operation on it. All right, so um, circling back to where we were, we understand that, that a joint um, is, such as the shoulder joint, is dislocated very commonly. Um, dislocation of the joints is usually very obvious to the person that's had it and to those people around them. Surgery will almost always be required for a dislocated shoulder. And if the first dislocation didn't happen at work, it was fairly likely that the shoulder would have dislocated again at some stage anyway. And one of the questions that I get asked a lot, and I'm actually interested in your opinion, so I'm actually gonna ask you all for your opinion, as to you know, how do we describe these things? If, for example, we've got a 20-year-old apprentice electrician who dislocated his shoulder playing rugby, he now goes to work and he happens to lift up a, a, a cable of wire at, at work and his shoulder dislocates. Now we know that his dislocation rate, even at home, was uh, probably you know, better than 80 or close to 100%. So is it now... Uh, truly a work cover injury and should work cover be responsible for him dislocating his shoulder when we knew it was going to happen anyway. So, you know, the difference between recurrence, aggravation, aggra um, uh, exacerbation, I I'd really like to get some comments uh, from, the, uh, from the audience as to um, what their thoughts are. There's, see, there's someone that's opened up a, a chat <laughs> over here. I, Michelle, I can't actually open the chat message at the moment. Ah, okay. Let me have a look. Um, uh, there isn't anything in the chat at the moment. Okay. It's showing one message there. Uh -huh. Ah, hang on a sec. I, I, no, I'm not seeing anything in the chat. Okay. No problem. Oh, hang on, I can see this. It's, uh, I had a question in relation to surgery to stabilize the shoulder joint. I was wondering if surgery itself doesn't also constitute a trauma which may result in OA of the joint. So look, that's a good question. Um, but the, the answer is if we're careful during the operation, then we stay away from the articular cartilage. You know, as long as our instruments don't gouge uh, holes in the articular cartilage, then, um, then no, the surgery itself doesn't create trauma to the articular cartilage. So opening the joint and then closing it, the nutrition from the synovial fluid is, is restored uh, generally within about 24 hours. And we, we're not aware of any long-term consequences of just having had shoulder arthroscopy in, in terms of leading to arthritis. You know, when, when we do uh, capsular releases, when we do rotator cuff tears, we're doing, you know, many thousands of these operations each year and they don't lead to arthritis. So I think it's fairly clear that it's the instability of the joint and the recurrence of the fact that the shoulder's moving in and out of joint all the time that leads to the osteoarthritis. So um, Dr. Sher, in relation to that, whose fault is it? query with the young yeah. person who we know has got has previously had a dislocation and or has some hyperflexibility 
would it not still be argued though by the lawyers that that um nevertheless the subject incident occurred in the workplace yeah and so, and so clearly that's sort of been been the the answer up to now um that you know the, the injury happened at physically at the workplace but i just wonder is is in fact you know are we giving the right answer because we know for sure that that shoulder was going to dislocate again and and one of the questions that that gets asked to me and i'm, I'm actually looking for guidance i'm seriously asking for, for, for help here one of the questions that often is asked to me it, would this um, injury likely have happened uh, at the same age and stage of this person's life had they not been at work at that particular moment in time mm -hmm. um, and and the answer to that is is actually yes it, it would have happened to them anyway um, but you know then then the, the counter argument is uh, they did dislocate their shoulder at work therefore um, you know work uh, is responsible for it so I, I'm genuinely interested in the comments from from the group yeah, okay. Maybe if you'd like to unmute yourself, you can do that by going to the bottom, usually the left-hand side of your screen, hover your cursor and you'll see a thing that looks like a microphone and you should then um, click on that and it will unmute. Doran, hi, Roger Palama, can you hear me? Roger, I hear you well, loud and clear. Look, there's a very, very interesting topic. Uh, the first thing is each case needs to be taken on its merits. Uh, it's a workers' compensation system, so the worker does tend to get the advantage. And there are numerous legal issues that also have to be taken into account. So I think the first thing is, let's take your case with a dislocated shoulder with somebody between 20 or 40. Let's say he does very well, treated conservatively, gets playing to, back to playing rugby, and it's only 10 years later that he has an injury. So what we want to know is, how severe was the injury? If he simply bent down to lift something and the shoulder comes out and it's soon after the first injury, then we can say exactly what you said, this is gonna happen anyway. However, if he goes for a longer time without treatment, back to playing rugby and he falls off a roof, you disregard the original injury because it would have happened anyway. So it's a matter of each case on its merits tending to give the patient the benefit of the doubt. So, for example, there's also the lawyers use the terms predisposition and vulnerability. And the example given is the eggshell skull. So, if somebody gets a hit on the head and it's a minor injury for you and me, but because of the eggshell skull, he actually dies, that person's up for murder. Whereas if he hit you or me, we would be fine. So whether a person has a predisposition or a vulnerability like an eggshell skull, legally, that's also taken into account. So it's not a straightforward situation and each case literally has to be on its merits and whatever answer you give, uh, you need to justify it medically as best you can. And, and you know the problem is that it's it's almost always sort of the 18, 19 year old who's had the injury within the last two or three months that that re dislocates. It's not usually that ten year interval. Sure. Um, and many of them do describe. You know, I was passing cables above my head as an electrician, or I was crawling into a tight roof space and things like that. So so that's where it does become a little bit complex in that in that it, you know it's very hard to actually allocate a, uh, a cause uh, in, in some of these people. But as you said, I guess for the most part, we give the worker the benefit of the doubt. So if in the case you just mentioned, the person who's had a dislocation is 25 years old and within three months he dislocates again from a minor incident, then you can say that was destined to happen. However, it's at work and the legal people will therefore say, uh, any surgery he has, and I would agree, any surgery he had needs to be covered, but when you assess the extent of his impairment, subsequently, you'll make a significant deduction for the pre-existing condition. Mm. And then again, you've got to describe why you're making that extent of the deduction based on your medical experience. Mm. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Pilama. Priya, you had a question? Uh, Priya asked the question on the chat. Ah, okay. Anyone else have any questions I would like to ask? 
Um, I was I, sorry. I was just going to raise something about that um, question on um, whether it's work related. It it depends on when you're being asked that question. I think so. Broad. I can only speak from really my experience in Queensland, but um, here at least there's a two stage process with claims. There's the initial stage. We call it a statutory process where um, somebody gets puts in a claim and if it's uh, if work is a significant contributing factor then it's approved and they get time off work um, if they want additional benefits and then they have to sue for negligence the relevance of um, whether somebody has a predisposition or um, a vulnerability to a particular type of injury is more relevant at that second point um, and there are um, factors which are applied by courts to reduce benefits to take into account those vulnerabilities. Um, whether it is the significant contributing factor to the actual injury occurring will depend on the circumstances of the, um, the injury and things. So if somebody's just walking along a, a corridor and all of a sudden they're um, leg falls out from under them because their patella has become dislocated. You could argue that that's really works not contributing to that, that you just, you're just there. It just, it's just the circumstances in which it happened. But if somebody's doing work related tasks and um, their um, shoulder dislocates, that's a, a bit of a different story. Um, that being said, that doesn't mean that they get um, the benefit of any incapacity that would result from their initial injury pre-work um, from their employer because that's taken into consideration. Right. Thank you for that, Jessica. That was really good. If there's anyone else in other jurisdictions who wanted to comment on that or contribute? No worries. Look, um, I, I'd like to thank you very much, Dr. Sher, on behalf of MAG. That was not only really, really interesting, but well presented, really comprehensive um, and just fabulous for, for the people that enjoy our seminars. Again, thank you very much for making your time available to us for this valuable session. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. The recording will come out to you within about a day. And we look forward to seeing you at our next seminar. Thanks again, Dr. Sher. Uh, thanks, Michelle. And if anybody wanted to reach out uh, to me, they certainly can do that through you. Um, I'm very happy to, to answer questions as well. All Thank right. You. Have a good day, everyone. Thank Terrific. you. Terrific. Bye.